Kimura Hala Hulutunia, Fauci Gu, He Holds Scots, the Celtic Podcast. On today's show, we'll introduce you to the Gallic for putting on and taking off clothes. That's very important. And we'll do that in Fekimich Beck and Gallic. We'll talk to you about, um, we're going to bring you the, the bonus story about the Stone of Destiny. We did a two part series on the Stone of Destiny, and um, come to find out, there was more to the story. So, we're going to bring that to you in our Celtic History segment. And I'll talk to you about Robert Burns Day, Robert Burns Night, in the Everyday Celtic Ways. That will be coming up here on the 25th of January. Um, throughout the program, we're going to hear music from Beyond the Pale, Dougie McLean, the Mary Plow Boys, and Rachel Sermani. And as always, it's a wee bit of Irish trivia to test your knowledge to start us off. So, who was the first High King of Ireland? The one who ruled it all. Alright, check out Gaelic for Sassanox on Facebook. Be sure to join up. You'll get daily Gaelic in your newsfeed. So, you know, keeping up on your Gaelic every day is very important. Keep it in your, in your life and keep it in your, in your mind. Remember LearnGallic.net. It's a great resource for all your Gallic learning, so take advantage of it. And anyone within the St. Louis area that would like to be a part of a weekly Scottish Gallic class, first of all, you should be a member of the St. Louis Gallic Facebook page. Um, but there, there you'll find out about those things going on locally. But if you just want to contact me, I can give you all the details. So Kirsch Maha, let's kick this thing off. Enjoy. Taker sighs, the lonesome organ grander cries, the silver saxophones say I should refuse you. Cracked bells with washed out horns blow into my face with scorn. It's not that way, I wasn't born to lose you. Honey, I want you. I want you. I want you so bad. Honey, I want you. Well, your dancing child in his Chinese suit I spoke to him, I took his food I wasn't very cute to him Now was I? Oh, but I did it because he lied Because he took you for a ride And because time was on his side And because I Honey, I want you I want you I want you So bad Honey, I want you Well now all my fathers, they've gone down to love I've been without it And all their daughters put me down Cause I don't think about it When I return to my queen of spades And talk with my chambermaid She knows that I am not afraid to look at her Oh, she is good to me There is nothing she doesn't see She knows where I'd like to be But it don't matter I want you, I want you, I want you so bad, honey I want you. They've gone down, true love, I've been without it And all their daughters put me down Cause I don't think about it mm, Well, I'll return to my queen of spades And talk with my chambermaid She knows that I am not afraid to look at her Oh, she is good to me There is nothing she doesn't see She knows where I'd like to be But it don't matter I want you, I want you, so bad, honey, I want you, I want you, 
That was I Want You by Beyond the Pale. And now it's time, Hi and Tom and Fekovich Beck and Gallic. It's time for Let's Try a Little Gallic. Um, I need to say this as I have in past podcasts that I am, or new, nor do I represent myself as an authority on the Gallic language, only someone who loves learning it and who wants to help other students in their journey of learning Gallic. What I teach comes right from the textbooks of well-respected Gallic teachers. I'm just trying to make something interesting, informative, and fun, which can help others learn and have fun as well. All right. Today we're going to discuss putting on and taking off of clothes. And as always, I will display on the screen what I am discussing. So, Toshik Shin, let's begin. Here are a few helpful but important verbs to use when dressing. Kur, meaning put, and hur, meaning take. Using these requires us to use a couple prepositional pronouns, though. Air, you should know by now if you have been following along the program, and ye, you might be seeing for the first time. So, um, we'll get to those in a minute. Um, hur means put, or um, hur, past tense, is put, or uh, occur, means putting. And you've got um, hur, take. You've got hook for took, past tense. And you have a torch for taking. All right. You know, you're going to need to learn these prepositional pronouns so you know whose clothes are being put on and whose clothes are being taken off. That's very important. <clears throat> I know you know air, but we're going to run through them anyway. So you got Ordem, on me, Orsh, on you, Air, on him, Orla, on her, Orden, on us, Ordev, on you, plural, Ora, on them. Now, ora sounds very similar to ora. On them seems very similar, sounds very similar to on her. But the correct usage come out in the context. All right? So you'll know it when you hear it. Now, yay, off. Um, yum, off me. Yit, off you. Ye, off him, ye, off her, yin, off us, yiv, off you, plural, and yiv, off of them. Right. Sorry about that, I had to fix the typo. Now, when you put the two together, you get hur plus air means to put on, so it's hur Orsht, put on you. Hur Orla, put on her. Or Hur, and then of course Hur Ye, take off. Hur Yit, take off you. Or Hur Ye, take off of him. Alright. Now, since you've got that, you're going to need some vocabulary to go along with it. Now, I know you probably have some of this already, but you may not. But we're going to go through them anyway. Elenia, shirt, brickish, trousers or pants, alien, for kilt. And that F, it sort of gets silent in there. Depends on where you're at. I know some places they pronounce the F, and other places they don't. But you're going to run into that a lot in Gaelic, where the, the pronunciation of something changes from island to island or glen to glen. So, you just have to roll with the punches. 
Spornum. Is it Sporn or Purse? Chris. It's Belt. Skorta. Skirt. Frocka. Dress. Brog or Brogan. Shoe or Shoes. Stoken or Stokenen. It's stocking or stockings. And you have Drahas. Panties. You have Kota. Coat. You have Shakach. It's Jacket. And then, of course, it doesn't have to be clothing you're putting on and off. You put on and off your glasses, too. So, Gloinichen glasses. Or, same thing. It's odd how this is one's female, one's male. Um, but, Specklerin glasses. So, they both mean the same thing, just different words. All right. Then, here's a few helpful adjectives that go along with those. Fada. It's long. Gorlich, short. Dorka, uh, dark. And Solia, light. All right. And to finish this off, we're going to give you six sentences here in Gaelic. Just translate them into English. You should be able to do this fairly easy. Chor Orsh, Dokhota, number one. Ha e Chor, Erlalena Aka. Two, Hor Hiet Dovrikish. Three, Hukiye An At Eka. Four, An Ro E Achur Er of Roken Ek Echia. Five, Kachavil Molenia Horum. Wow. All right. That's it for Fekimich Beck and Gaelic today.
Banks and Braves by Dougie McLean. Next, we'll delve into the rich history that is our Celtic past in the Celtic History Break. Today's topic is, it's a bonus story. We did a two-part series on the Stone of Destiny, and then I found out there was more to the story. So, the uh, bonus story here is the stealing of the Stone of Destiny. I thought this was a pretty, pretty cool story. The Stone of Scone. Or stone of destiny the ancient stone upon which scottish monarchs have been crowned was taken from scone near perth in scotland by king edward i of england we all know him as longshanks in 1296 during the struggles against english invasion which historians call the scottish wars of independence as a spoil of war they kept it in westminster abbey in london and fitted it into King Edward's chair. Sub uh, subsequent English and then British monarchs were crowned sitting upon the chair and the stone. At the time, the stone was viewed as a symbol of Scottish nationhood. nationhood. By removing the stone to London, Edward I was declaring himself King of the Scots. But, in 1950, Ian Hamilton a student at the University of Glasgow approached Gavin Vernon with a plan to remove the Stone of Scone from Westminster Abbey in London and return it to Scotland. The plan was funded by a Glasgow businessman, Robert Gray, who was a counselor on the Glasgow Corporation. Now Vernon agreed to participate in the plan along with Kay Matheson and Alan Stewart, who were also students in Glasgow. By removing the stone, the group hoped to promote their cause for Scottish devolution and to reawaken a sense of national identity amongst the Scottish people. So on Christmas Day in 1950, the four Scottish students from the University of Glasgow, Ian Hamilton, Gavin Vernon, Kay Matheson, and Alan Stewart, removed the Stone of Scone from Westminster Abbey in London and took the stone back to Scotland. The students were members of the Scottish Covenant Association, a group that supported Home Rule for Scotland. And then in 2008, the incident was made into a film called The Stone of Destiny. Now, an American actress, Kate Mara, she portrayed Miss Matheson in the movie Stone, uh, The Stone of Destiny. Charlie Cox, Billy Boyd, and Robert Carl also starred. Now there's another film, and Sessanuck followed, uh, focused on Miss Matheson's interrogation by the authorities. Um, Gaelic singer Kathleen McInnes plays the role of Miss Matheson. It also told of her dedication to Gaelic and how she drew inspiration from the works of Victorian Gaelic poet Māori Vor uh, Nam Orden. 
the big Mary of the songs. Now, Miss Matheson, who drove the car carrying the stone through police blocks, roadblocks, sadly, she died in West, Western Ross at the age of 84 back in 2013. However, at the time her and the others took the stone, she had been studying domestic science at the University of Glasgow when she joined the plot to take the stone from London. During the raid on Westminster Abbey, the stone broke into two pieces. Police launched a huge manhunt, but driving alone, Miss Matheson was able to negotiate roadblocks and cross the border into Scotland. No one suspected a lone woman of being involved in such a crime. In the weeks that followed, police arrived at her, you know, finally arrived at her family's croft in Western Ross and searched the property. Five months later, the students placed the stone that they had hidden, also known as the Stone of Scone, in Aubroth Abbey. Upon discovery, the authorities had it taken back to Westminster Abbey. But, in 1996, it was returned to Scotland as a symbolic gesture and is now kept at Edinburgh Castle. Miss Matheson, who later became a teacher and Gaelic scholar, had worked hard to revive the use of Gaelic and Western Ross and promote nationalism and was a popular and respected teacher and figure in the local community. Now, Miss Matheson and the others, they were not prosecuted at all. Mr. Hamilton had told the Observer newspaper in 20, 2008 when the film based on his book uh, about the 1950s incident was released the government had feared Scots would take to the streets and revolt uh, if the four of them had seen uh, had ended up in the courts or seen any jail time and that many believed that they had attained folk hero status at that time now Miss Matheson was living in a recently was living in a care home in Alta Bay near Loch U when she died and her at her funeral Rob Gibson the Scottish National Party the um, minister for the Scottish Party for Catherine Southern Sutherland and Ross paid tribute to her he said her exploits in retrieving the stone made her one of the immortals in Scottish nationalist history Wow That is quite a story. All right. So today, the stone sits in, in Edinburgh. That's cool. All right. Back where it belongs. All right. The winds are singing freedom They sing it everywhere They sing it on the mountainside And in the city square And they sing of a new day dawning When our people will be free Come and join our song of freedom let it ring from sea to sea In the battle streets of Belfast Can't you hear the people cry For justice long denied them And their crying fills the sky But the winds of change are singing Bringing hope from dark despair There's a day of justice dawning You can feel it in the air And the winds are singing freedom They sing it everywhere They sing it on the mountainside And in the city and they sing of a new day dawning When our people will be free Come and join our song of freedom Let it ring from sea to sea 
too long our people have suffered in their misery and their tears and foreign rulers used our land for about 800 years it's a long road has no turning and i know someday we'll see a day of justice dawning when our people will be free and the winds are singing freedom they sing it everywhere they sing it on the mountainside and in the city square and they sing of a new day dawning when our people will be free come and join our song of freedom let it ring from sea to sea there's a time laid out for laughter there's a time laid out to weep there's a time laid out for sowing and a time laid out to read there's a time to love your brother there's a time when hate must cease if you sow seeds of justice you can reap the fruits of peace and the winds are singing freedom they sing it everywhere they sing it on the mountainside and in the city square and they sing of a new day dawning Let it ring from sea to sea Come and join our song of freedom Let it ring from sea to sea Now, that was The Winds Are Singing Freedom by the Mary Plow Boys. Now it's time for Everyday Celtic Ways, a look into your, how our Celtic heritage is still very much a part of our everyday lives. Today we're going to tell you about Robert Burns and Robert Burns Night, which is coming up soon, if January 25th. Look in your local calendars and your local Scottish um, St. Andrews Society. Um, they should be doing something. Now, Robert Burns was born 1759 in Alloway, Scotland, to William and Agnes Brown Burns. Like his father, Burns was a tenant farmer. However, toward the end of his life, he became an excise collector in Dumfries, where he died in 1796. Now, throughout his life, he was also a practicing poet. His poetry recorded and celebrated aspects of farm life, regional experience, traditional culture, class culture, and distinctions, as well as religious practice. He is considered the, the national poet of Scotland. Although he did not set out to achieve that designation, he clearly and repeatedly expressed his wish to be called a Scots bard, to extol his native land in poetry and song as he does in The Answer. Now here's a little excerpt from that. Even then in wish, I wish that to my latest hour shall strongly heave my breast, that I for poor old Scotland's sake some useful plan or book to make, or sing a song at least. Wow, I like that. I like that Scots language. It has a flow to it. Now perhaps he had an uh, in, in Tim animation that, that his wish had some basis in reality that he describes his Edinburgh reception in a letter on December 7th, 1786 to his friend Gavin 
Hamilton. I am in a fair way of becoming as eminent as Thomas a Kempis or John Bunyan, and you may expect henceforth to see my birthday heralded among wonderful events in the Poor Robins and Aberdeen Almanacs, and by all probability it shall soon be seen as a most worthy and most wise man of the world. Wow. He kind of uh, called it, didn't he? Now, he is considered Scotland's national poet today, and he owes much of his position as the culmination of the Scottish literary tradition, a tradition stretching back to the court makers, to Robert Henryson and William Dunbar, to the 17th century vernacular writers from James VI of Scotland, to William Hamilton of Gilbertfield, to early 18th century forerunners such as Alan Ramsey and Robert Ferguson. Burns is often seen as the end of that literary line, both because his brilliance and achievement could not be equaled, and, more particularly, because the Scots vernacular in which he wrote some of his celebrated works was, even as he used it, becoming less and less intelligible to the majority of readers, who are already well-versed in English culture and language. The shift towards English culture and linguistic heg uh, the language had begun in 1603 with the Union of the Crowns when James VI of Scotland became James I of Great Britain. It had continued in 1707 with the merging of the Scottish and English parliaments in London, and it was virtually a fait accompli by Burns' days, save for pockets of regional culture and dialect. Thus, one might say that Burns remains the national poet of Scotland because Scotland, Scottish literature seized with him, thereafter yielding poetry to the English. Nonetheless, the very qualities which seemed to help Burns create the Romantics were the local responses to the 18th century Scotland in which he was born, and his hum humble agricultural background made him in some ways a spokesperson for every Scot, especially the poor and disenfranchised. He was aware of humanity's unequal condition and wrote of it, and of his hope for a better world of equality. Throughout his life, an epistle, poem, and song, perhaps most eloquently in the recurring comparison of rich and poor in the song for a tat and a tat, which resoundingly affirms the humanity of the honest, hard-working poor man, the honest man, through ever save poor, is king of men for that. Wow. Burns is this important and complex literary personage for several reasons. His place in the Scottish literary tradition, his pre-Romantic proclivities, his position as a human being from the less privileged classes, imaging a better world. To these may be added to his particular artistry, especially his ability to create encapsulating and synthesizing lines, phrases, and stanzas which continue to speak to and sum up the human condition. Now, what endears me to Robert Burns was that he was a rhymer, a local poet using traditional forms and themes, and occasionally and sometimes Ex, ex, ugh, extemporous productions. These works are seldom noteworthy and are sometimes biting and satiric. He called them little trifles and frequently wrote them to pay a debt. These pieces were not thought of as equal to his more deliberate endeavors. They were play, increasingly expected of him as a poet, though. He probably would have disavowed many now attributed to him, particularly some of the mean-spirited epigrams. Several occasional pieces, however, they deserve a closer look for their ability to raise the commonplace to altogether different heights and show the true genius of the man, the poet Robert Burns. Now, my favorite of these, which was created extempore more or less as a blessing for a meal, was created seemingly without effort, in 1786, Burns wrote to a haggis. 
to peen to the Scottish pudding of seasoned heart, liver, and lungs of a sheep or calf mixed with suet, onions, and oatmeal boiled in an animal's stomach. The hearty meal of the common man burns praise of the, his meal has contributed to the elevation of the haggis to a status of the national food of Scotland and one of the main, main symbols of Scotland. This poem is expounded at every Burns dinner worldwide after the haggis upon its silver plate is carried by procession of pipers and drums to a lofty place of importance where the poet having given thanks for the haggis existence and substance cuts. He cuts into the pouch with great reluctance and reverence before dividing up amongst all diners the delicious steaming and fragrant meat pudding. It is a sight to behold, and may I add, very good, as too. Yeah. A testament to Robert Burns is that his birthday not only made it into the almanacs of his day, but is remembered worldwide, where his poems are delivered to fresh ears and young minds that will love them and carry on his great works for generations to come. All right. Now, if you guys have never tried haggis, I'm going to give you a, a little tidbit here. A good friend of mine named Jim Walters, he makes haggis here in the United States. Now, haggis was, you can't get real haggis here in the United States. There's a, a ban on it. But there's no, you can't import it. But if it's made here, that's different. And Jim Walters makes it and cans it. And it's really good. It's really comparable to the real haggis I got when I was in Scotland. And you can get that on Amazon. Buy the can. That's a little expensive, but $12 a can. But if you ever wanted to try haggis, go on Amazon, look up Caledonian Kitchen or haggis, and uh, give it a try. You'll like it. All right. Well, that's it for Everyday Celtic Ways. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you liked it. I'm trying to keep it interesting, informative, and fun. For me, anytime you can infuse something Celtic into your day, it's a good day. I'd like to thank all the supporters and kind words, all the new subscribers and viewers. Just, I can't thank you enough. It's a top of level heart. Thank you, friends. Now, before I go, the answer to today's trivia question. Who was the first High King of Ireland, the one who brought it all together? And that would be Brian Boru. He was born in uh, 941, died in 1014. He was the Irish king who ended the domination of the kingship of the O'Neills. Now, Brian first made himself king of Munster, then subjugated Leinster, eventually becoming high king of all of Ireland. Now, he was the founder of the O'Brien dynasty and is wide, widely regarded as one of the most successful and unifying monarchs in medieval Ireland. All right fascinating. Now, remember to check out Gaelic for Sassanex on Facebook, Duolingo.com, LearnGaelic.net, um, ACGAAmerica.org, and of course, check out my YouTube channel for um, your Scottish, your Celtic podcasts. I've do, been doing Gaelic music videos where you can actually see the lyrics in the English and Gaelic so you can learn the songs. So, and I've got a lot of other things on that, on that channel, so just give it a check. All right, Martian Leave in Drasta. Bye for now. I'm going to let you go with a song, A Fond Kiss by Rachel Sermani. Fond kiss, and then we sever. If we will last forever, deep in heart, wrong tears, I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans, I'll wait. 
shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him mean a cheerful twinkle lights me dark despair around the night me Had we never loved so kindly Had we never loved so blindly Never met or never parted We'd had never been broken hearted Nothing could resist my Nancy For to see her was to love her Love but her and love forever Sighs and groans out.